welcome to uh, this uh, event. Um, Tom Weiss, of course, is well known to all of you and doesn't need an introduction, but I'll give one anyway. Uh, before I begin that, I would just uh, like to um, invite everyone to the reception, which will follow the discussion, follow the talk, and um, let you know that that's going to be up in the Ralph Bunch Institute, of which Tom has been the director for many, many years. <laughs> <laughs> and just uh, transferred over that uh, responsibility to John Torpy, who uh, is present here as well. Um, so this uh, event is co-sponsored by the Center for Global Ethics and Politics here at the Ralph Bunch Institute, which I direct, and by the uh, Ralph Bunch Forum, uh, which Peter Romaniuk is the director. Absolutely delighted to be able to uh, feature a talk by uh, Tom Weiss, who is Presidential Professor of Political Science at the CUNY Graduate Center and Director Emeritus of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies here. Uh, he's also Research Professor at SOAS at the University of London. Among his many awards and distinctions, um, he's past president of the International Studies Association chair of the Academic Council on the UN System, and editor of Global Governance. And he's written extensively about multilateral approaches to international peace and security, humanitarian action, and sustainable development. His latest author <coughs> volumes are, even after the one which we're going to be having the hot off the press introduction about today, Humanitarian Business. Um, his um, includes even the more recent, Governing the World, Addressing Problems Without Passports. That was 2014. Just, <coughs> is it out yet? No. no. Coming <laughs> And then there's the United Nations and Changing World Politics, also in 2014. Global Governance, Why, What, Whither, Humanitarian Business, What's wrong with the United Nations? These are all books. This is amazing. What's wrong with the United Nations and how to fix it? Um, well worth a read, I'm sure. Humanitarian intervention, ideas and action. Thinking about global governance, people and ideas matter. Humanitarianism contested where angels fear to tread. Global governance and the UN, an unfinished journey and UN ideas that have changed the world. That's off since 2009. How'd you do that along with running the whole talk? That's amazing. So this is the book uh, that you have the flyers about on your chair, and about which we're uh, really eager to hear today what this means, uh, the intersection of humanitarianism and the market equity, and the interrelations among them, between them rather. So please join me in welcoming Tom Weiss. Kind words, Carol. I can guarantee that my two irreverent daughters would do a slightly different introduction to these matters. Um, Carol has asked me to speak for 40 minutes or so, leave some time for questions, and I will take that seriously because I recall um, one of the last courses that I taught when I, before I came here. I said Brown, and we handed out questionnaires to undergraduates. Who, um, filled in, and I was never quite sure what to do with these because, in fact, half would say too much reading, too little reading, he speaks too much, he speaks too little. <laughs> but there was always one last question which you could write anything, and I used to read those with some. And one day I got <coughs> to one that said, Where would I like to spend the last hour of my life if I had a terminal disease? <laughs> And the answer to that was in Weiss's course, because the last one seemed like an eternity. <laughs> so, I will try to behave myself. Um, this book is about humanitarian business, and because this is in Carol's uh, series, I, I wanted to tack on some thoughts at the end on a topic that I did a lot of work on a long time ago called consequentialist ethics. Um, in the, on the cover of this book, uh, making my friends from the ICRC very happy, I juxtaposed a kit with a well-known symbol and uh, another well-known symbol. Um, 
The idea here is to be provocative, but actually it's also to be quite accurate. And um, I see some of my friends from the humanitarian uh, industry here. Um, supposedly the adjective connotes everything that's good, uh, and the, the noun, uh, sort of uh, the opposite end of the spectrum, wheeling and dealing, etc. The image of the Good Samaritan pops up because we're only interested in people. Uh, and the welfare of those, uh, and we're unaffected by politics and markets. Uh, business, of course, uh, is slightly less lofty territory. Uh, the common goods ignored talk is cheap, tough decisions are made without taking people into account. Well, obviously, our reality is slightly different. Uh, humanitarians in this book and elsewhere are steeped in politics and calculations of various sorts. Um, and the functioning of an aid and a protection agency intersects with home and host governments, with soldiers, with belligerents, with peacekeepers, local populations, and most crucially <coughs> in this book, with sources of funds. And so if you're procuring funds and redistributing funds, this has huge implications, not just on the people who are there, but it also has implications for humanitarians and for headquarters. Um, over the last 25 years or so, um, I think there have been three gigantic factors that make, or that lead me to say the humanitarianism ain't what it used to be. And it's these three factors, militarization, politicization, and the marketplace. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about the first two, and then the, the rest of the talk is going to be about the third. Um, the idea here is that um, the characteristics of a, of a humanitarian agency are supposed to be independence, I call the shots, neutrality, I don't come down at one side or the other, and impartiality, that whoever needs it, gets it, it doesn't matter your, your gender, your age, your location, your ethnicity, your political affiliation. Well, militarization, and this is going to be very uh, cryptic, but involves two phenomena, both of which mean the military is in charge. One is the logistics bonanza, the cornucopia of everything that you need um, from plastic sheets to transport. But the second is the use of military to do only what the military can do, which is to provide security. And over this period of time, starting with the first Persian Gulf War and coming up through what's happening, or what happened in Libya and what's not happening in Syria, um, and from too little, too late Rwanda, and some people would say too much too soon in, in Kosovo, and I, I, but that's the argument. But at any rate, the, the, the presence of military forces changes the situation on the ground. And whether or not you want to try to pretend you're independent, neutral, and impartial, uh, the perception at least is otherwise, as well as the reality. Now, politicization. Uh, this, I guess you could say that militarization actually is a subset of this, but I tend to think about it separately. Because the business of humanitarians has become almost exclusively civil war. <laughs> During this period of time, donors, while they're giving money to multilateral agencies, they're tying more and more of it to particular activities, particular sectors, particular parts of the world. <coughs> humanitarians themselves have also decided they're not in the band-aid business only. We have to address root causes, including human rights. And perhaps the most important thing is in the post 9 11 world, uh, uh, Colin Powell said uh, humanitarians are force multipliers. Um, and that says a lot. So whether you're associated or you seem to be associated with the US, with NATO, with the African Union, with the UN, they're perceived as taking sides. So these two phenomena alone have changed the, the arena. But what I'm really uh, concerned about is the, is the latter in this book. Um, but before I get into that, I just want to make clear 
in my shorthand what I'm talking about. So humanitarian action is protection as well as delivery. Sometimes these things are seen to be mutually reinforcing. Frankly, oftentimes they are in conflict. Secondly, uh, humanitarian retains great resonance, as I mentioned earlier, but most of the definitions, including the one by the International Court of Justice, circle around and say, well, actually humanitarianism is what the ICRC does. <laughs> um, we're back to independence, neutrality, and impartiality. And part of the argument here is going to be that what worked in certain situations, what provided decent guidance, certainly in natural disasters, but provided decent guidance in interstate wars, do not provide guidance here. I actually like this notion of humanitarian space because this suggests that it opens and closes. Things get better and worse. It's, you may be secure in one spot and very insecure in another. And finally, humanitarian intervention means overriding or not paying any attention to the consent of the parties who are in the area where you're operating. There are other forms of uh, intervention, sanctions, and, and the International Criminal Court and other kinds of tribunals. So it's that package that I talk about when I use the word intervention. So who are the suppliers? Um, this is um, a very simplistic diagram. And I want to say three things at the outset about the diagram. One, obviously, it's a, it, it's a simplification. I'm just trying to say who shows up, what Linda Pullman called the crisis caravan. Who arrives on the scene of the disaster? The second is that obviously if in a particular country or a particular arena or a particular moment in time, these circles would be bigger or smaller or more or less important. Uh, you know, the military in Iraq before and after the U.S. withdrew was, would be quite different. The size of the media presence goes up and comes down, etc. So but this is just allows me to talk about who shows up. So if we start at uh, 1 o'clock, uh, international NGOs, these are the people who are mainly contacting you through uh, direct mail and other ways uh, to look for support. The problem here is the extraordinary heterogeneity of this, of this group. Um, there are lots of 800-pound gorillas. There are probably 15 or 20 that account for the three quarters of the business, but you also have a lot of mom and pop operations who actually end up joining. Uh, the last time uh, the UN did a calculation, there were 2,500 international NGOs that arrived at the scene of the disaster. That survey goes back to 200 and 2003 or 4. Um, if you include the rest of the gang who might be uh, there are close conflict uh, operations or in development before you come up with somewhere close to 40,000. So this is part of the picture. The International Committee of the Red Cross at 3 o'clock um, is in a category of one. Category by itself holds on to the international conventions, but also has a staff of 10, 11, 12,000, depending on uh, the year, operates in about 75, 85 countries a budget of about $1.2 billion. Unlike, I mean, it's at least possible to generalize about this category because there's one in it. <coughs> UN organizations, um, the UN system, the, the three major ones, UNHCR, UNICEF, and the World Food Program, account for uh, close to, well, two-thirds of the $12 billion a year that's run through the UN system. Um, obviously, the uh, system is a bit of a misnomer um, uh, if it's supposed to imply sort of some sort of central order coherence. Um, <coughs> I tend to use the word as do others' family because like most of our families, this one's pretty dysfunctional. Um, bilateral aid agencies, they also show up. Um, the ones that I think people forget that the United States typically finances about a third of everything that goes on in the humanitarian arena. 
Uh, USAID obviously has an agenda. So does the Department for International Development in the UK, but so do actually lots of other aid agencies that are usually seen as um, being less, uh, uh, have fewer national interest priorities on the table. And the other big player of, uh, in this arena is the European uh, Community <coughs> Humanitarian Office, which obviously also has a political agenda. Outside military forces, clearly you've already talked about those. This has become a major phenomenon of the post-Cold War era, but it also, you know, they're, they're, this started after World War II with occupation forces in, uh, in Germany and uh, other parts of Western Europe and in Japan. And there's a long experience of what the military can do and cannot do fairly well. Finally, a relatively new actor, or at least in numbers, is for-profit firms, which um, <coughs> actually in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, next, other than the U.S. Army, they were the most uh, numerous uh, in terms of individuals on the ground. Um, this is not just mercenaries, the private military uh, companies and security providers, but there also are private firms in, involved in this. So this is part of the equation. And then we can put in the media uh, as well. Um, much of the earlier literature in the mid-1990s, the late 1990s, about CNN determining what went on was obviously vastly overstated. But the presence of media is really important. The problem is that uh, the media wants to tell a story, humanitarians want the media to tell a certain story to help raising money, and those of us in the analytical business would like the media to provide some information. <coughs> now, the final, which is the local actors in the marketplace. This is the phenomenon that is the least studied. It's the one that's hardest to generalize about. Um, it's an arena where I wish far more anthropologists and sociologists would spend some time um, because it's this sort of context that determines a lot of what goes on and most of us don't speak very knowledgeably about this. So, you know, the, who shows up, whether it's the, the armed government or the armed belligerents, uh, whether it's the recipients of one sort or another, organization, civil society, the local businesses. This is all part of the demand and supply chain that is part of the marketplace. So, I'm now going to move to the size of the marketplace. I think that if we were at the uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania Business School or somewhere, uh, MBAs would probably consider this a non-trivial uh, uh, place as, a, as an economy. It's important to look at the growth alone um, because, for instance, UN organizations haven't increased, but their budgets have skyrocketed. The other players have increased in numbers as well as the resources, but 1989, there was globally about $800 million of emergency assistance going on. Ten, year, ten years later, about $4.5 billion. Ten years later, 17 billion. Uh, 2011 is the last year we have figures. It was around 18. As I mentioned, the number of NGOs uh, it has gone through the roof. The number of involved governments as well. I think people tend to forget about governments. At the pledging conferences in the early and mid 1990s on the on the Balkans. About 15 countries regularly showed up. If you go to the 2003 pledging conference for uh, the slam dunk in Iraq, there were 75 countries. If you move to the tsunami and later today, there are probably 95 to 100, and each of them with particular agendas. Obviously, the OECD countries still account for the bulk of this, there's a lot of growth elsewhere. How many people work in this arena? Uh, uh, some have calculated 200,000. 
uh, my friend uh, Peter Walker at, uh, at Tufts actually said we don't have a clue, which is probably a better answer. But probably uh, a tenth of that, or $30,000 if you're looking at professionals of one sort or another, both local and expatriate. What I find really important to consider is the, the multiple sources of funds that go into this business. Um, uh, I mean, if, 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 if this could be a lot more active, uh, it would be called kind of spaghetti junction between the, the, the monies that are going particularly from governments to local NGOs, international NGOs, uh, regular budget funds, extra budgetary funds, their own peacekeepers, UN peacekeepers, it goes on and on. And all of these are alternative sources. They also contribute to what is a concern by agencies with being uh, part of this market. And obviously the invisible hand works here just about as well as it does in our own economy. Um, and for me, it would really be important to have fewer moving parts. Uh, and I've been told, of course, as long as I've been in this business, that that's unrealistic. But it, it, there are just are way too many moving parts here. And there is absolutely no centralization of any sort. Uh, so I, I actually would, we could get into this in questions, I would like to see more consolidation as opposed to the other words that are usually used, like coordination, and cooperation, and collaboration. Anyway, this is the nature of, of what goes on. So the, the final thing that enters into this marketplace are the local war economies. As I mentioned, this is much harder to generalize about. But there are two big uh, concerns that one has to factor in. Uh, the first week of uh, uh, international relations theory or comparative politics course we're talking about the importance of territory. Uh, this has absolutely nothing to do with control of territory. It has to do with the control of resources. Sometimes diamonds and timber and oil and what have you. Um, but sometimes it's actually the, the, the stuff of humanitarian aid. Um, uh, actually, uh, and the, the ability to to benefit from uh, chaos, the ability to benefit from civil wars, uh, is a new way uh, of making a living, not a very handsome one. Uh, when, uh, actually, uh, uh, Susan was uh, still working on her dissertation, when she did an interview somewhere in the Eastern Congo, she said, well, what's it necessary to start? An army, and the answer was well, about ten thousand dollars in a in a cell phone. So the 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 nature of chaos within in these arts and the nature of the economy is really critically important. And then the final thing is that what's peculiar about the aid economy, uh, and and just briefly, I've listed four uh, factors. The first one being that actually more violence means. Uh, more suffering, which means more assistance, which means more opportunities for delivery and makes more opportunities for, for, for local profit. And there really aren't any barriers to entry here. Um, there used to be, but there, there really are none these days. Secondly, um, resources are fungible. Um, if you're in control of an arena, uh, you're expected to provide certain sorts of uh, health and food and shelter and this kind of things. And once you provide that from the outside, of course, it leaves those same resources uh, to raise health locally. So this is a different part of the local economy. The third is just corruption. What is the cost of doing business? What do you have to buy off here, there, and elsewhere? The last time I tried to put numbers on this, it was as high as 75% in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Other places, it may be 15 or 20%. Let's take figures somewhere in between. Anyway, this contributes to um, 
the costs and the pluses and the minuses of assistance. And finally, um, the, the, the distortions that occur in the local marketplace uh, when you're a gardener or a driver uh, make multiples of what the minister or senior official in a government makes, you contribute to a different sort of local economy. So all of this is part of uh, what we're looking at. So while um, nobody goes into the humanitarian business to make a fortune, let's face it, we don't support humanitarian agencies uh, because of their bottom line. The kinds of words that, that have come up are really part of this. Supply, demand, competition, distortions, monopolies, oligopolies, cost, price, efficiencies, investor biases, these all go on. So, Karen, uh, Carol said, well, you know, so what? Um, you know, what, where does this leave us? Where does this leave us as humanitarians? Where does it leave us? As panelists. My uh, conclusion here would be to reverse, I don't usually uh, quote my late mother, but I'm going to quote her because we have to do the opposite of what she used to tell me. Um, when she really got angry at me, she said, you know, you basically so you don't just stand there, do something. <laughs> well, what I'm actually calling for here is to don't just do something, but stand there. It's important to get a handle on globally what's going on, but even more importantly, within local context. And um, so the, the, the recommendation here is more reflection and less reaction. Um, it's the, the kinds of uh, networks, the kinds of training that we insist upon for accountants or physicians, we don't insist upon for humanitarians. Uh, Peter Hoffman's there, we, we, we wrote a piece a long time ago basically saying what we need is the humanitarian equivalent of military science. We need actually social scientists who pay attention to what's going on, area specialists who are steeped in um, humanitarian issues and understand humanitarian cultures. Um, now, usually um, humanitarians get a little offended by this notion. The military is fat. They get too much money. Et cetera, et cetera. But one thing the military does do is spend time and effort uh, trying to figure out uh, ongoing crises. You can say that they're always fighting the last war. But they, in order to be promoted, in order to, to, to continue, you really have to invest time and effort in revisiting where you've been, what's worked, what hasn't worked. And so my call to stand there is a call really for evidence-based, context-driven uh, assistance. Um, intuition and good intentions, I don't think they were ever enough, but they're certainly not enough in contemporary war zones. Uh, and so this, this appeal to consequentialist ethics um, is basically say that responding from the heart is great. You need to have sound thinking as well. Um, that um, insignia no longer protect you. You're targets of warring parties. You can make matters worse. Um, and so this idea of reflection is as part of a humanitarian equivalent of military science is it is what for me is in the bottom line. Um, now this obviously may sound like a uh, self-serving uh, recommendation from a researcher. Um, I, I'm not looking for work. What I am looking for is both students and, and, and colleagues who make use of what social scientists should be able to do, gathering information organizing that information, interpreting that information, and disseminating this information. 
And so it seems to me that a partnership of sorts between um, aid deliverers and human rights defenders and social scientists really uh, is, in, is in order. And the part where I think I, I need some help, apparently, is in distinguishing, I think, for me, what I would call that the, the only first order principle in this business is human life, the dignity of human beings. Independence, neutrality, impartiality are not ends, they're means. They're guidance that works in certain situations and doesn't and do not work in others. And therefore, this sort of, sort of mindless uh, application of these principles doesn't get us very far. Um, so, it seems to me that modesty is a virtue uh, for an analyst, and it's a modesty, it should also be a virtue for uh, humanitarians. Um, I think that during the years that I've been involved interviewing and other sorts of, in this arena, the word, I, I think what I've now determined is that humanitarians use the term, there's a, an imperative, there's a humanitarian imperative. Mm -hmm. We have to act. And we have to ask cons consistently. Well, you don't have to be a student of comparative politics to understand that no two crises are the same. Um, that such a notion of a humanitarian imperative flies in the face of politics. It flies in the face of limited resources and making tough decisions. It flies in the face of not wanting to at least make things, uh, you would like to make them better and not worse. So I, I actually think that we should use something like the humanitarian impulse that sometimes we can act, sometimes we cannot. Sometimes we can make matters a lot better, sometimes only a little better. But in order to do either of those, um, one needs to have uh, evidence, one needs to have understanding of the local context. So I'm not looking to paralysis by analysis, but I am talking about trying to get a better handle on what's going on and what works, or what works better or worse than other options. I think frequently uh, one uses the term dilemma, and I don't think that's right either in this business, which, because a dilemma for me means that there are unintended, unavoidable, and equally undesirable consequences. I don't think that there are equally undesirable consequences. You've got to find out what those consequences are and act accordingly. So I think the word sort of quandary might be better. One is perplexed by this. But one does not stand the, on the sidelines when it gets involved in the scrum, but based on knowledge, not on instincts and intuition. Uh, so this calculus is it's not going to be easy. It's gathering the information, as anybody who's worked in these places alone, is no uh, easy feat. But I think it requires, uh, as I say, input not just from lawyers and political scientists, but really from sociologists and anthropologists as well to help get a better handle on this. Um, so, you know, humanitarian has this wonderful, nice ring to it. Uh, strategic, um, cold. but I think what I'm talking about here is, is strategic thinking about humanitarian issues for strategic doing in humanitarian uh, emergencies. Um, actually, a, a giant in this field, a guy who works at MIT for a long time, Myron Wiener, um, actually, early on, he didn't call it consequentialist ethics, he called it instrumental humanitarianism, but it's, it's really the same thing, that it's getting your hands on the information and acting accordingly. So, 